Well, welcome to Forest Hills Church Online. My name is Pastor Andrew. We're so glad that you can join us in this way. Uh, we want you to know that we are a church who loves God with all of our heart, that we seek to grow in our faith, and we hope to serve through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And uh, right now, we are talking about famous conversions. We're looking at the stories of people coming into contact with Jesus uh, and, and learning how their, their lives have changed so they are set on uh, a new mission, a new path of life. We uh, started this ser- series talking about the Apostle Paul and his dramatic story that we find in the book of Acts. And this week, we're going to be talking about a man named Augustine, who was one of the great church fathers, early church fathers. He, um, he was a great teacher, a great writer, and we're going to hear his story Um, And so our memory verse comes from his story. It's Romans 13, 14, of course, written by Paul. And it says, Instead, dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't plan to indulge your selfish desires. That's going to be the crux of Augustine's story. And so as we prepare to hear about his conversion, we come to the Lord in worship and praise. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way when there ain't no way. Rises up from the empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you. What he's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus Let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Who can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years until the past to disappear? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and Who can work it all for good? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Who would take my cross to Calvary? Pay the price for all my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free. And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. And let my Jesus change your life. Greetings to Forest Hills Church. I'm really delighted to be here today. I'm your district superintendent, Michelle Hargrave, and I'm going to be reading the scripture today, which is Romans 7, 14 through 25. And this is the Apostle Paul bearing his soul as he recounts the battle that wages within himself. As Christians, it is a fight we all identify with and an enemy with which we all must engage. This is Paul. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm made of flesh and blood, and I'm sold as a slave to sin. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing that I hate. But if I'm doing the thing that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is right. But now I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me, that is, in my body, the desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives in me that is doing it. So I find that as a rule, when I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. I gladly agree with the law on the inside, but I see a different law at work in my body. It wages a war against the law of my mind and takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this dead corpse? Thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I'm a slave to God's law in my mind, but I'm a slave to sin's law in my body. Here ends the reading. Today we are looking at famous conversions, at stories of people coming into contact with Jesus. And when people come into contact with Jesus, their lives are changed. Last week, we described some underlying factors that conversion entails. Things like a vision of the truth. That's the thing that initiates conversion. Seeing and understanding the truth. And the truth is not always a pretty picture. The truth points out the simple and ugly fact that each and every one of us sinners, that we are far from perfect. And the truth is that that sin is a problem. But while the truth is busy pointing out this problem to us, it's also directing us into the arms of forgiveness, into Christ, where we are forgiven, where we are set free. And the result is joy. But conversion doesn't stop there. The final crowning characteristic of conversion is a changed life and a new mission. We said last week, the proof of conversion is in the changed life. And we saw these characteristics play out in the story of Saul. He was struck blind on the road to Damascus. He had a vision of truth, of Jesus himself, this conviction of sin. Jesus asks, why are you persecuting me? And that sin leads to an experience of forgiveness. And boy, did it change his life. He went from zealously hunting down Christians in their homes to planting churches, to preaching all about how Jesus was the Son of God. Saul's conversion was quick. It was definitive. It was very dramatic. But we know that not all stories play out like Saul's did. His conversion story is in the Bible because that's how it happened, but it doesn't mean that all conversions should occur in the same way. In fact, each of us has a unique and different experience of meeting with Jesus. Maybe some of us are actually still in the process of being converted. Maybe we, are, we have yet to come into full contact with Jesus. Maybe we're struggling with uh, the notion of our sin. Maybe God is still revealing to us the truth. Maybe we haven't fully, quite fully accepted forgiveness. And if that's true, 
of you today. I just want to encourage you to keep seeking, to keep praying, to keep clinging to His Word, and also to keep in mind the following story of our next famous convert. He is known as Augustine, or St. Augustine. He served as the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, which is now modern-day Algeria. And Augustine is considered one of the most influential of the church fathers. His writings tend to focus on the great gift of God's grace as our means for salvation. And so as a result of that, many Protestant thinkers, especially the Reformers, they have attached themselves to his teachings on grace. He wrote a book called The City of God. It's one of the great theologies written in defense of the Christian faith. Um, my, the version I own, it's only about a thousand pages if you are looking for some summer reading. Uh, but much more approachable, much more easy to digest is Augustine's other book called Confessions. It is um, basically his autobiography. And it, it's interesting because it reads basically as a letter written to God. So throughout the book, Augustine addresses God as you, you. So that provides a very prayerful, a very intimate picture of Augustine's walk with God. And so I do recommend, if you have the capacity, um, it would definitely be a book well worth reading, the Confessions. Um, Augustine was born in 354 in North Africa. His father was not a religious man. But his mother, Monica, she was incredibly devoted to the Lord, as we'll see later on. Uh, Augustine, growing up, was a brilliant student. He was well-read. He was trained as a philosopher, a rhetorician. Uh, he worked as a professor, basically teaching others how to argue, how to debate well, how to speak publicly in a polished and erudite manner. But as a professor, he also was a learner. He never stopped learning, and throughout his years, he was never just content to settle on one mode of philosophical thought, because he found that after thinking them through, they would come up rather empty, or there would be some inconsistency that he would be unable to harmonize. But Augustine wanted to find truth, but he found that he was not satisfied with the answers that he had come across. Well, eventually, to better his teaching career, Augustine moved to Milan, and there he met with a man named Ambrose, who was serving as the bishop there, and Augustine attended his services and listened to Ambrose preaching, but he did so only to observe, only to appreciate his skills as a speaker. Augustine did not pay attention to the content of the sermons. But he eventually found that despite himself, some of the content was seeping in. Some of it was making an impression. And he found that he could not keep the style and the content apart. Who would say the Holy Spirit was up to something in Augustine? But in his confessions, Augustine admits, he writes, I was not yet ready to pray with a groaning humility for your help, that is God's help, my impulse was for intellectual challenge. I itched for argument. And so, in his quest and cha for, for challenge and for argument, Augustine dove deep into the abyss of living into his own pride. He sought to be the best at what he did and to sink his identity into the recognition he received and into earning higher teaching fees. But he also became lost in his lust of the flesh. He maintained a mistress for many years, uh, who he never bothered to marry and who served to fulfill his desires. But Augustine thought himself to be a moral, good, upstanding citizen. He had his, his set of values. For example, he avoided the games, right? That is the spectacle of the gladiators. And he didn't go in for such he didn't believe in such barbarity, so he stayed away from the games, and therefore he was a good person. But despite his self-congratulatory gold stars, Augustine was slowly coming to grips with his own prideful outlook. He came to realize that he had dismissed Christian teaching without ever fully understanding it. 
that what he knew about Christianity, he knew from secondhand sources or even heretical sources. He admits, he says, the only notion I had of Christ at that point was of a man wise beyond all others. Now, doesn't that sound like our world today? How often do people reject Christianity without actually knowing the claims of Christ? Or how many people, if asked about Jesus, they admit that he was a very wise teacher, maybe the wisest. And yet his wisdom, instead of being followed to its conclusion, it's at best just sampled. And at worst, it's twisted into something else entirely. And so, that's why good teaching is so crucial. That's why God's Word is so crucial. Because wisdom can be easily twisted. And, and, and it's also why commitment to Jesus cannot just be characterized as an easy thing or something that we just kind of add into the mix of life. We read in John chapter 6, uh, Jesus is teaching about how he is the bread of life, about how all must partake of him in order to be saved. And the people listening decided that the teaching was too hard. It was too confusing. It didn't make sense to them. And Jesus goes on to say that no one can come to, the, to him unless the Father enables them to do so. He says that his followers must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And at this point, many of his disciples turn away. They stop following Jesus because things got too hard, too confusing. Following Jesus where he actually leads is hard because where he leads is to the cross. Following Jesus is hard because where he leads is to the cross. He tells us plainly that we must take up our cross and follow him. The cross is a place of misery and torture and death. We don't want to go to the cross. We don't want that kind of pain and sorrow. But what we fail to see is that beyond the cross is a lush, beautiful pasture, a place where quiet streams flow and where our souls are restored. But see, the way to that heavenly pasture is through the brutality of the cross. And so we come to a question, can we stick with Jesus? Can we follow him all the way? Or are we going to turn from him when things get hard? Well, after experimenting with different teachings, teachings of dualism uh, and Platonism, which is just these different philosophical ideas, Augustine worked through those and he continued his quest for truth. And he writes, I came to the reverend writings of your spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, and especially to the Apostle Paul with a grasping eagerness. I love that phrase. How often can we say we come to God's Word with a grasping eagerness? That even before he was converted, even before that moment, Augustine considered the Bible to, to have value. That in these, in these pages, he saw some sort of light that he was grasping for with eagerness. Now, halfway through his confessions, Augustine refers to himself as one on the brink. He writes, The life I had led disgusted me, no longer on fire as before with ambition for glory and wealth. And so we can see that he's beginning to see truth. The Holy Spirit is beginning to bring about a conviction of sinfulness, right? He's had a vision of truth. He's been reading God's Word, and now... He's understanding sinfulness and he has become disgusted with his life. Have you been there? Augustine also sees that his will to choose has been chained by a chain. He writes, a chain that begins with an urge and that urge yielded to becomes a compulsion and the compulsion unresisted becomes a slavery. So urge to compulsion to slavery. And he sensed in himself two wills, one old, one new, one of the flesh, one of the spirit, each warring on the other, and between their dissonances, my soul 
was disintegrating. Have you ever been there? Now, one day, Augustine was visited by a friend named Pontician. Uh, and Pontician began to tell him a story about some other acquaintances that they had had, and these friends had come to Christ. And as he spoke, Augustine writes, I'm actually just going to read, the, read right from the book, and just listen to this description of coming to grips with oneself. Uh, he says, well, while Pontician was telling this story, you, Lord, used his words to wrench me around in front of myself, dragging me out from behind my back where I had cowered to avoid seeing myself and planting me in front of my own face where I could see the foul me, how distorted and dirty, how spotted, how ulcerous. The sight revolted me, but there was no escaping it. Each time I tried to turn my gaze away from me, he went on with his story, and you kept holding me there, thrusting me into my own face so I might look on my sinfulness and learn to hate it. I had known of it before, but I kept obscuring, giving in, not remembering. And Augustine goes on to say, he writes a prayer for chastity. He, he would say, God, give me chastity and self-control, but not just yet. I was afraid you would hear me too soon, heal me too soon from my sick urges, which I wanted intensified rather than terminated. So has that ever been you? Have you ever been disgusted with yourself? Or have you ever prayed for change, fully intending to do what you can to keep your life as it is? Or, or prayed for forgiveness, all while planning on sinning? Have you ever been at war? And in fact, we are all fighting or surrendering at this very moment. We are either fighting against our sin or surrendering to our sin. Or we're either fighting against God's Spirit or surrendering to God's Spirit. And we know the path to victory comes when we surrender to God's Spirit in order to defeat our sin. We heard earlier Paul's estimation of himself. He calls himself a wretched man. We see the same effect here in Augustine. Seeing his sin, knowing his guilt, and hating it. Seeing his sin and trying to forget about it to obscure it, right? Anything to avoid having to admit it. And we know that the struggle between two wills plagues us all. Now, finally, Augustine gives into a, a sort of a fit of jealousy. He could not understand that this story he had just heard about people finding joy in salvation. He was upset that these non-philosophers managed to surge ahead of him in their quest for truth, while he, with his education, was still mired in sin. He did not understand that. And in, in, in his frustration, he ran out into the garden and he began to weep what he calls great sheets of showering tears. And in that state of contrition, in those moments of humility, Augustine hears the voice of a child he assumes, from the neighbor's yard. And this child's voice is chanting, lift, look, lift, look, lift, look. So Augustine writes, I leapt up, not doubting that this was by divine prompting, that I should open the book and read what I first hit on. So he runs, he grabs his Bible, he opens it to Romans 13. And this is what he reads. Let's behave appropriately as people who live in the day, not in partying and getting drunk, not in sleeping around and obscene behavior, not in fighting and obsession. Instead, dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't plan to indulge your selfish desires. Augustine writes, the very instant I finished that sentence, Light was flooding my heart with assurance, with joy. And Augustine went on to be baptized 
and he gave his life to the work of the church where he eventually became a bishop in Hippo. And he was well known for his abilities to speak and to write and his skill at defending the truth of Christianity. And in this regard, we see many parallels with the Apostle Paul's story, right? In both men, God had invested great gifts and abilities, and in both, those gifts were ultimately used in service to God and to the building of his church. Both men heard a voice, one directly from the Lord in Paul's case, and one that directed him to the word of the Lord in Augustine's. And we also have a very interesting cumulative effect here, right? The fact that Paul's conversion and his changed life now directly affects the conversion of Augustine. Paul's faithful work leads Augustine to the Lord hundreds of years later. And I think we can claim the same for ourselves, that our faithful work can and will do the same. If we remain faithful to the Lord, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but down the line, our faithful work can lead others to the Lord. Now, certainly there are many differences. Unlike Paul, Augustine spent years struggling to find the truth. He agonized over what to believe and why. And in the midst of that struggle, the Holy Spirit was hard at work until the scales were finally tipped and Augustine reads the words that Paul himself had written. And in those words, he glimpsed the truth and he saw his sin for what it really was. He discovered the joy, the assurance of forgiveness, and he took on a new mission in life. Augustine was converted. He was forever changed by his Lord and his Savior, Jesus Christ. But remember last week. Last week, we said, disciples make disciples. In Paul's amazing conversion story, there's a normal guy named Ananias who is faithfully serving the Lord, and he comes to uh, disciple Paul. Augustine's story is no different. We mentioned earlier his mother, Monica. And Monica was a true believer. She was a faithful disciple, and she fervently prayed for Augustine's salvation his whole life. She never accepted that he would remain lost, and she placed all her faith into the power of the Holy Spirit to convert her son. At one point, uh, as she labored over his salvation, she, she even asked a priest to meet with her son and, in order to refute his bad thinking and convince him of the truth. But the priest encouraged Monica to keep praying. Leave the boy alone. He's not ready. He won't listen. But he told her, be off and get on with your life. The son of such tears as you are shedding will never be lost. And he wasn't. And Augustine knew well that his salvation was not just happenstance or a result of his personal uh, quest. He knew the prayers and tears and time that his mother had invested on his behalf. He knew that his connection to Jesus was an answer to her prayers. And so I want to ask if you might be willing to be a Monica. Would you hold up those you love, those who are lost, those who have rejected the gospel, or maybe they've never heard the gospel? Would you hold those people up in prayer? Would you invest your tears into their salvation? Would you let your heart break for those who are lost? We can come up for a million reasons why we don't pray for such people. And there are a million distractions that get in the way. But every conversion has a Monica. Every conversion has, uh, uh, every heart that is turned to the Lord benefits from this groundwork of prayer from faithful believers. So I want to invite, invite you to be a Monica and to lift up someone you know who is lost, who doesn't know the Lord. Ask God to reveal himself to that person. Ask him to soften that person's heart. And it might feel like an impossible prayer, that surely this person will never change their mind, they've been hurt before, or they have um, this, this terrible story in their past, or whatever it might be, we know that we can't control their heart and their mind. We know that it is an impossible prayer. 
But we also know that we serve a God of the impossible. And so I want to just ask you to pray with me right now for those people who do not know the Lord. Would you join me? Father God, we understand that you work in mysterious ways. Lord, we understand that we can't control the hearts and minds of people no matter how much we love them. But we can express our love to them, Lord, by keeping them lifted up before you in prayer, just as Monica did with her son. It might take years, Lord. It might take days. We don't know. But we lift up those who don't know you. We lift them up by name. We lift them up, Lord, in our hearts. And we ask that you would move in their lives to bring about conversion, Lord, to give them a vision of the truth, to show them, Lord, a conviction of their sin, to embrace them with your arms of forgiveness that they might know the joy that it is to be set free. And Lord, that you would bring about a change in their lives, that you would set them on a path of discipleship. We ask this, Lord, knowing it's impossible. We ask knowing that there are so many factors at play but we declare that you are God over all of those things. And we ask you, Lord, to reveal yourself to those who do not know you. Help us, God, to continue to be in prayer for these folks, that we wouldn't just make this a one-time thing, but that you would move in our hearts, Lord, to be burdened um, by their lostness, that we would not be okay with it, that we wouldn't be content with them being nice people who don't know you or um, people who seem to have their life together who don't know you. Move in us, Lord, to be a constant presence at your throne room on behalf of these folks who don't know you. We lift them up to you, Lord. We pray in faith and in great hope that you will move in their lives. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, as we come to the end of our service, I want to encourage you to, uh, to, to keep on praying for those who don't know the Lord, that we all have been converted, and everyone who hasn't needs to be converted. Uh, and it's, a, it's such a, a wonderful thing how Jesus comes to each of us in such a unique way. Uh, so next week, we're going to be talking about a Catholic nun named St. Teresa of Avila. And uh, she has a very unique story, and we're going to hear how Jesus reached out and how she was converted. So I want to encourage you to join us for that. But as we go, we go with our memory verse, Romans 13, 14. Instead, dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't plan to indulge your selfish desires. So let me dismiss you as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor, and may you continue to know the joy of his forgiveness. Go in peace. Amen.